Perfect. The Subcommittee on Technology Planning to Order. We do have some construction noise outside, so we'll ask people to speak up, but I think we'll do all right. We will take up the following items for approval. Action item 1A is the approval of the minutes of the September 26, 2013 meeting. I move the approval of item, action item 1A. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please? Any opposed? Any abstentions? This matter is approved. With no policy items on the agenda, <coughs> I will address the information items. There is one information item on the agenda. Information item 2A is the IT Capital Project Review. Vice Chancellor and Chief Information Officer Seb Formoso will present on this item. Vice Chancellor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I want to try to do today is to take you all through a number of critical IT projects that have been funded by capital. And um, as always, we start with our underlying mission and our underlying objectives for all these projects, which is to modernize the systems. Uh, and that means to try to move us as quickly but as safely as possible to cloud-based solutions. Uh, and as we do so, we always look for opportunities to improve efficiency and advance the automation of the management of the systems so that we can improve reliability within our IT processes. And uh, we always look for the ability to improve the customer experience. How do we make the systems uh, more useful? And how do we remove the friction of our, of our staff and our students who use these systems every day to do their jobs? So we think about that as we implement things. And obviously, the foundation, which is to remain secure and protect our data. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, a project that I talked to you a while ago, which was the implementation of the Security Operations Center. We spent uh, $10.1 million on software. And uh, as you can see, beginning on September 24th of last year, that was the day that we had the <coughs> unfortunate breach at Baruch. And our ability to roll out this software exponentially grew as a result of that. Right now, we have visibility to 75,000 devices uh, within the CUNY network and within all the schools. And by visibility, I mean not only are we able to see if these devices have been attacked by a virus or a uh, a malware attack of some sort or a ransomware attack of some sort. But we've also have began to use the system to disable or prevent that device from infecting other devices. Right? The system gives us the capability not only to see, but to act. And we are using uh, very methodically and very carefully the capability that the system gives us to be able to act on the devices to prevent any, any, uh, any bad actors from, from causing us a problem like what we experienced last year. As a result of that, uh, our uh, risk has decreased materially in the space of identifying and isolating attacks. I don't want you to think that that is the only thing we have to do. We are still working on how to protect ourselves uh, relative to protecting the data, uh, and how to protect ourselves better relative to overall secure access and privileged access for those who have high availability to all our systems. And we also need to think about how we're going to protect ourselves against our vendors or from our vendors, right, because they interact with our systems and they may not be doing something like this to their systems. So, so there's, there's more work to be done, but this has been a, a dramatic change in a very short time. When I, when I met with our partner from Palo Alto and I shared with their chief information officer that we had deployed 75,000 devices in such a short time frame, um, he was incredibly surprised. He said that he had not seen something like this even within the large pharmaceutical industry. Um, so we continue to do this. We're never, we're never going to be, you know, I don't want you to think that we're done, but this is something that we continue to do every day. So do me a favor. When you mention Palo Alto, just explain to the board all those things. I mean, it's, I think the board is not in the day-to-day -day stuff of what we do, so it's always helpful to put all in, into the framework. So, so Palo Alto is uh, one of our partners, one of our strategic IT partners, and they provided us 
and we procured from them the software that we deployed to these 75,000 devices, right? So to, they're, they're very, very critical to us. They also provide us, um, you, you might have heard the term Unit 42. That's a, a set of experts from Palo Alto who perform deep forensics for us on any incident or any problem we identify so that we can try to trace the source of the problem and determine if that uh, incident has caused us any material harm in terms of moving any data that the bad actor should not have moved. So we have successfully used their services since I've been here multiple times uh, when it comes to these such incidents. What does that allow us to do, Seth? I mean, I think it's important to, to put it on framework, right? If we're able now to look at a, a device and if that device is corrupt, we could isolate that device and take it offline. Correct? Exactly right. Okay. That's exactly what we can do. The, we can do it manually or we can uh, program the system to do it. And right now we're programming the system to do it so that given that we're not here 24 by 7, and the system is, the mm -hmm. system can monitor the environment on, on a 24 by 7 basis. And if it identifies anything of high, something that is causing us a high level of risk, the system uh, disables the device until we can look at it further. Or if it's doing, if the device is doing some serious damage, we will block the device permanently. Yes, then. What's a device? I mean, can you a give, device? like if, would there be categories of devices? Is, is, um, is this a device? It's attached to your system. Right now, the devices are the PCs and the servers. In the future, we can extend the capability to a cell phone, uh, an Apple uh, watch. Uh, we already have the ability to see other devices on our network, cameras, and other, other devices that are located in the classrooms that are IP addressable. Anything that is IP addressable, we will be able to monitor. We started with the PCs and with the workstations and with the servers because those devices have been... Are student computers devices? Uh, if it's provided by CUNY, yes. We, have not, we are not monitoring non-CUNY devices. So if you bring your own phone to work and you, and, you, and you join our network, I'm not monitoring your device, but the network that you join right, with your personal phone is segregated from the regular network. We're doing things in the network to prevent the bring your own device to the office situation from crossing into our CUNY network. But I think it's important to connect that to the other, the, the other system that we put in place that allows for, right, we're, in, each, in each campus there is a set of walls that we put in place, right? And also that is connected. I mean, I think you need to yeah. disconnect all So of I'm going to talk to you about the firewalls, which is addresses your, cons well, your issue that you're raising that. But that, that's, since we have, we are just beginning to do that, that's actually at the end of this presentation. We're doing some really exciting things with the firewalls to be able to uh, manage the network in such a way so that if we have an event, it will not spread laterally across the entire campus or the entire university but I'll talk to you about that. Uh, that's actually the last chart on this deck. So, so the, uh, the implementation of the SOC is well on its way. Um, next, denial of service. So what is denial of service? We have a vendor called Arbor that has been here for quite a while, and they assist us with denial of service. What does that mean? That the vendor sits at the edge of our network. And if we receive a denial of service attack, which could be, could, someone could be intentionally doing that or it could be unintentional. By denial of service attack, I mean someone sends us millions of emails, therefore flooding our network, making it impossible for those who need to access the systems to be able to access <coughs> the systems because the network gets flooded and you can't actually <coughs> use the network the way it's meant to be used. And uh, we've successfully implemented uh, this Arbor technology, uh, but we made a major upgrade. The technology was implemented in 2018. And the technology has the ability not only to block a denial of service attack, but also <coughs> to route traffic. We can actually, when we experience this problem, 
we contacted Arbor, or we contact Arbor, and we route our network traffic to them. They then scrub the traffic and only send to us those things that should be coming to us, therefore minimizing the user impact during an actual denial of service attack. And what we were able to do late last year was upgrade this hardware. This hardware sits at the edge of our network. Uh, but just to give you a sense, these are 2023 numbers. And in 2023, 67% of the alerts that we received on these devices were actual critical uh, attacks, right? You can see that we had over close to 266 attacks, and these have gone unnoticed by the people who are using our systems because our Arbor denial of service software is working as designed. And our current run rate for 2024 is actually about the same. I looked at those numbers, but I wanted to show you one full year of information to give you a sense of what's happening. Uh, we're in constant contact with this particular partner. Uh, whenever we see something, we have a service where they contact us, and we contact them so that we can triage the situation and determine whether we can let the hardware manage it or whether we need to reroute our traffic to them and have them scrub our traffic so that the network does not slow down. Right. So that was another, another thing that uh, we were able to complete. We're, we're right now right in the throes of finalizing a couple of things on how we're going to configure that system. Moving on, we also completed two other projects related to applications. We use capital for both of these. We did a degree works upgrade. So what is degree works? Degree works is a system that the students use to be able to map out what classes they need to take in order to be able to receive a degree. An incredible important system. Uh, it, it degree works also interfaces with not only our course talk system to plan courses, but it also interfaces with financial aid. It's a very critical part of, of the academic portfolio. Um, in the degree system had not been upgraded for quite a while. We were at least five levels back. In fourth quarter of 2022, we upgraded the system. We brought it up to speed to the latest version. And that removed lots of uh, usability problems. It made it easier for the students to use because it was now able to be used in multiple browsers. It made the system more secure. Like anything else, we, we needed to come up and, and be current. The other thing that that's allowed us to do is uh, last month, we upgraded the system again. And next month, we're going to upgrade it again. Because of the upgrade we made in 2022, by getting up to speed and becoming current, now the upgrades that we're doing, like the one we did last month and like the one we're going to do next month, are not projects. They're much simpler to do. They cost a lot less to do. And we can schedule them over a weekend. And that is a result of maintaining currency, right? And we want to achieve that because we want to be able to provide the academic affairs folks the latest version of this very critical system. So that was what happened with Degree Works, and a little bit of the background on that. On CUNY, uh, first, GASB compliance. Um, GASB compliance was a federal requirement. And we had to work with Oracle to upgrade our CUNY first system so that it would meet the federal GASB compliance rules. Um, we completed this in the third quarter of 2023. Um, this took quite a while. It took us the better part of last year to complete. Uh, and it required us to leverage some capital dollars to be able to enhance the overall system to become compliant. And we are current compliant. And now what we can do, instead of, again, executing a project to maintain compliance, we just maintain the system based on the updates we get from our business partner, Oracle. Yes, ma'am. Was this like um, GASB, um, I guess it was 90, 97? And there was one on leases and there was one on subscription that was the, the issue, the new GASB requiring all sorts of things. Was, was this that? Um, yes. Um, I look at my partner, Christina Chiapa, but that's a resounding yes. Okay. Um, I, I would think it might cost millions to actually figure out the right answer for each of our 
leases in each of our software subscriptions, but, but why would it cost one and a half million dollars to, to, to change that? It seems like it would be, you know, you're, we're storing a different answer to a question. So we have, CUNY First has been modified by us extensively over the last mm -hmm. 10, 15 right. years. The code that we got from Oracle, right, to make their system GASB compliant had to be regression tested. So we had to make modifications on top of the modifications we had made to CUNY First so that that code would work mm -hmm. seamlessly. And then we had a number of consultants who were here the better part of the year testing and retesting everything and verifying that we could continue to close the books appropriately. So um, the, re the reason we had to spend that kind of money was because we're not running a standard Oracle campus solutions. We're running a customized version. And whenever we change it, we need to verify that all of our customizations are uh, verified and in some cases we have to rewrite them so that the system continues to work as per specification. Okay. Oracle Identity Management. So this is a, a project that we launched to achieve one identity across everyone at CUNY. Right now, staff and students, those of you who use our systems, many have at least three different credentials, which means you have to have three different usernames and three, three different passwords. You may be using the same password, but you don't realize that the passwords are being saved in different places. And um, we need to be able to get to a place with, with one ID, with one set of credentials, anyone at CUNY can log on to any system they need to either do their job or to learn. And uh, as a result of that, we, this is one of the things that I identified very early on when I got here by meeting with all the campuses. I noticed that we did not have a centralized ID management system, that I could not go to one place and print out everyone at CUNY who logs on to CUNY first. This is obviously not ideal. You want to be able to have centralized ID management, so not only do you know who's using your systems, but if you wish, you can communicate with one email to everyone. Right? That's, that's something that uh, it's not easy to do today. And what we've been doing is we've been working a number of things. We've been working with Oracle, and Oracle has agreed to modify their product. They liked what we proposed, and they actually modified their product so that um, their product now is going to handle our enhancement, and they're going to roll that out to other schools. We've been testing their product, and at the same time, we've been migrating over 300 applications that are not using Oracle Identity Management. We've been migrating them from whatever identity management system they're using, either at CUNY Central or locally at a campus, so that they all use the same system. You can imagine that that has to, done, has to be done very delicately, because you don't want to impact people's ability to come to the office every day and access their system. So we're working very closely with the campuses and we're down to, we have to migrate another 150 applications, which we expect to have completed by the end of the year. And by the end of the year, everyone will be using one identity management system. I'll be able to go to Wendy Hensel, and she'll be able to look across the campus and, and identify all people using any one of the applications, which will make it very powerful for the provost's office. It also will minimize our risk. It's much easier to protect one identity management system than three, as you can well imagine. So it also helps us. But this will be a very big uh, productivity enhancement when everyone is on, under one platform and we can just manage whatever access you need from one platform. Yes, Matt. Well, when we talked about this, I guess it was a year or two ago, um, the student representative was concerned about the student side risks to this, that students have lots of different emails, they use lots of different systems, they may communicate, you know, in ways that are outside of CUNY's system, and um, I guess it was, it was 
presented as kind of a trade-off between having a very secure single way for the students to deal with us, which is easier to be secure, um, versus uh, losing them um, because they don't either don't want to use CUNY's thing or they are, are routinely using something else so they don't prioritize this. They don't pay attention to the messages they get sent over your channel because they're... Uh, and I'm just wondering what we're doing to manage and mitigate that risk. So I think we've eliminated, not mitigated, eliminated that problem. Right? A student today has got to remember, if a student today works at Graduate Center and has a relationship with Hunter, they have two different IDs. Tomorrow they're going to have one. But they can have, their IDs can be, uh, we can use aliases. So I can have a Hunter ID that ties to my central ID at CUNY. And you can email me at Hunter if I'm a student. Or if, if, and I will see all of my emails in one mailbox. And the Graduate Center person that I work for can email me at my Graduate Center ID, and I will go into one mail. I don't have to log on to two mailboxes. And we share this with the students. And they have been, they're, they're saying the sooner the better, right? We're going to eliminate the need for them to track multiple emails. They'll be able to see all of their email associated with whatever relationship they have with us as a student, as an employee, as a whatever they're doing, and whatever, whatever campus they're doing it at. And we're already seeing this work for the campuses that have come on board. Well, that's managing a particular risk, but it's not managing, it's, it's managing the, the, the CUNY IDs that the student has for CUNY systems. It's not managing the rest of the student's life where the student has an Instagram ID and a Google ID and a various other kinds of ways of communicating. Is that ours? I mean, that's not ours to manage. That's not well, ours it isn't to ours to manage, but on the other hand, it's a risk that, that we so. face that the student is not going to pay attention to our communications because their life involves something else. Well, it's only going to pay attention on... A well, we could be right, but if we start losing chunks of students, I'd rather also... But, but the students are now, as I understand it, logging into various different... <clears throat> whatever they are, portals, depending upon what they need to do, if they want to register or they want to look at, you know, course requirements or whatever, they're doing that now. They're, they're going to continue to log into something CUNY, the new unified system, to do any of that. If they want to do Instagram or TikTok or, you know, Facebook, that's their life, that's not our lives. They don't go into Facebook to look at what courses we're offering. And, and by the way, we solved the problem that the, that, the, that the student raised. The problem that he raised was connected to was a Brooklyn College student who was, who was to sit here, raised was, right, you know, was this whole issue of multiple emails at CUNY. And so we solved that problem. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what email you use, it's going to go. You're never going to not get information, no matter mm -hmm. what campus or how many campuses you're, you're, you're working on. That other issue is a communication issue, which was really not connected to to, to, to this system. This system is all about safety. Yeah. See, I, I, would argue, I, I heard about the issue that you raised from when we, we meet with the students when we designed this. We invited them. Um, and I heard about, you know, we see that they use other channels. While this doesn't address that directly, it will make, it will make the problem less. I agree. Right, because if I give the students one relationship mm -hmm. with us, yeah. not three or four, they're going to leverage that relationship with us, not try to use the social network to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, one thing that came out of the discussion about a mandate for using the new LMS for online courses was, yeah. the, was one thing that came out of a discussion was the variety of third-party applications that faculty utilize for classroom instruction. And my question is, is there a public-facing API that people can use to take advantage of this single sign-on, or is that just these uh, applications that you can migrate over that you spoke no, about? We, 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 uh, no, we, we have an API. If anybody wants to be able to, so as we engage with the campuses and someone is telling us we're rolling out a new application, we're not gonna connect it to the old ID, ID management system, 
we can we're connecting all the new rollouts to to the new to Oracle Identity Management. Absolutely, that's the enhancement we made with Oracle, so that we can evolve over time. We don't know what's coming down the line, but we want to make sure that whatever comes down the line, we'll be able to work with our Oracle Identity Management system. So absolutely, we have that. That was one of the critical things that we want to establish early on, so that we weren't just migrating what we currently have, but we're migrating whatever might be coming down the line, down the path that we don't know about yet. Next, uh, a couple of boring projects, but nevertheless incredibly important for us. So we upgraded our storage, uh, our physical storage um, at the CUNY Central Data Center. And, and in doing so, we bought ourselves some additional capacity. Uh, we got 183 terabytes of it, and, and we doubled the speed of the storage. That's incredibly important. The speed at which the systems can access data on the storage is directly attributable to how fast the applications work. So we were able to achieve that, and at the same time, we were able to reduce our expense line by reducing our, our year two, year three maintenance expense for those devices. So, so this is part of looking at our environment and making sure that we maintain it with, with, you know, with current infrastructure, with current technology, so that we don't allow the environment to atrophy. And we looked at what was going on in the data center, and late last year we completed the upgrade of the storage in our data center and preparing us to whatever might be coming down the line. We did the same thing with the disaster recovery. The disaster recovery center, which is located at the ASRC, was also running out of space and we were concerned that we were going to run out of headroom. We were running around 80 percent capacity. So we made an upgrade there as well so that we could have capacity uh, as we see the data that we store in the disaster recovery environment. The data that we store there is that uh, it's all the CUNY central data, the CUNY first data and all the things that we collect here, which we on an annual basis run a test up there and verify that our systems work. But now we have uh, uh, basically the latest technology when it comes to our storage. The, this not only brought us um, <coughs> more capacity and faster access, but it also brought us some security. The new technology that we procured brings with it some firmware that allows us to monitor for any anomalies on anything touching our storage. We're always thinking about, you know, how can we prevent any data loss and this gave us some, it reduced our risk when it comes to data movement. And we were able to see when things um, that are going on in the storage look like an anomaly to us. Two critical projects that we completed uh, last year. Before I talk to you about this, I want to show you this chart. So the core CUNY network is the, the, from the bottom up, right, you have CUNY Central, you have the campuses, and you have our data center at Hudson Street. Those things have dual connections to two networks, two networks that are uh, internet facings. Those networks are located, as you can see, in different parts of New York City. The, the entire point of this chart is redundancy. We have two ways in and out. <coughs> so that we are never dark in the internet, right? One of the things that I was told when I got here, make sure that we are never dark in the internet. That could be career limiting. So that's why we have redundancy. And, and this is a very simple view of redundancy, right? So let me go backwards now and tell you what we did there. That, those two data centers, those two internet-facing data centers had a lot of end-of-life equipment. So um, in early, la early last year, we began to plan, and we spent $2.8 million on capital, capital dollars, basically replacing every piece of old hardware in, one of the, in these two data centers. We did this throughout the year. It took us uh, the better part of the year. We had 23 different pieces of equipment that we replaced. We moved 52 network connections. 
and we did 51 individual changes, which were done either at night or on weekends or holidays. And we got ourselves into a much better place today. The, it's quite resilient. We, we've had issues, and when we have an issue, the, the, uh, the technology switches over to the backup sites without anyone noticing except my team, and then we work on getting the primary site or the backup site up and running. Uh, but what's most proud, you know, what I'm most proud about this, and this, this huge change that we made is that no one noticed. No one, we never impacted academic activity. We never went dark. We were able to manage it at night and on weekends and in times where no one noticed that we were doing. We were able to make all of this happen quite smoothly. The team did a sensational job. It took the coordination of just about every member of my team to make this happen. So now, we're, now we're, our, our systems are quite resilient and we're basically uh, running the latest technology in these two internet-facing data centers. We don't have to worry about that. We can dedicate resources elsewhere within, within IT. So this is for the future. As you can see, the chart changes here, and we say upcoming projects. So we've been looking uh, at the telephone systems, at the voice systems that campuses use to communicate. And those systems, in most places, are in need of replacement. So the first thing was to figure, and, and we know we have, we have Microsoft Teams. And if you've know if you been at uh, BMCC, at uh, Borough Manhattan Community College, you know that they don't have phones. All phone connectivity is done through a Teams interface, and it's quite, quite nice. And their phones, instead of costing $600 each, cost $35 each for those who have to have a, head, a, a phone set on their desk. So over the last 12 months, we looked at what they did. We looked at what Queens did. Queens also did the same thing, and it works quite well. But there were some things about the BMC system, with all due respect and credit to Queens, there were some things about the BMC system that looked a little bit better. So we made a decision to, micro, to scale what BMCC did across CUNY. And right now we're working with procurement to understand how we can scale, how we can procure the necessary support from the vendors, right? Because you need not only Teams, which we already have, because we own Microsoft 365, but we also we need a back-end system. How do you connect to the phone system? How do you connect to the circuits? How do you dial 911 when you have to dial 911? How do you make all of the other intricate voice things work correctly? And that's the piece that we're trying to figure out. And that's the piece that BMCC did that came out a few points ahead of what Queens did. And we're working right now with procurement uh, with my peer, Martin, to figure out how we can procure and make this go forward. And this is all part of shared services? This is absolutely part of shared services. So shared services covers voice, data network, and servers. And this is a project that's going to not only allow us to improve the situation at Bronx Community College, Lehman, and Baruch, but also allow us to get a step ahead on our shared services project. It's serving two things. But right now we're focused on the customer experience at those three schools. Campus network modernization, you've seen this before. This is our modernizing the, the Cisco devices that are throughout our schools, right? 56% are, are end of life or were end of life as of last year. And uh, we uh, thank you. The Board of Trustees approved this. We are right now doing the post-Board of Trustees approval process, which is to work with procurement to follow the appropriate steps and get this approved by the folks at the controller's office and the state AG's office before we sign the contract and proceed. We expect to start work with um, Cisco and a couple of other vendors in May of this year. But there has been already extensive planning. Um, one of the first schools that we're going to be visiting to do this is going to be Bronx Community College, who uh, I've talked to multiple times and visited, and they are in need of a, uh, a big refresh in their hardware. Uh, just to give you a sense of who's in and who's out, this eye chart shows you the uh, 16 schools that opted in. Uh, this was, you, you opted in if you felt that you could take advantage of what we were doing for you. And, and the schools that did not opt in either were already current or already had plans in place that we did not want to disrupt with a project from Central. 
So this is the modernization of the campus networks. Within that project, uh, the campuses are going to be working to ensure that the wires in the buildings, the wires um, between the buildings, are all appropriately up to speed so that these incredibly fast routers that we're going to put in their campuses can take, they can take advantage of them by making sure that their internal wiring, and we're also working with their facilities people, and they're well aware of the, the surveys they have to do to make sure that they take advantage of the investment we're making in their behalf. And this also is tied into the work we're doing with DOT, right, on the streets? Right? Yeah. Okay. So, so well, this also ties into shared services first, right, because this will give me one of the things that we're doing here is where we have, today the campus networks are all designed a bit differently. We are going to design the campus networks so that we have one design in Baruch. Uh, I can solve the problem in Baruch with the Queens College network expert. I don't have to always have the expert from the campus. The reason we need specialists today is because we made everything so different. And one of the objectives within this project is to standardize the network design. That allows me to have central visibility and that allows the campuses to share these incredibly valuable resources who understand their situation so that they're not always you know, having to rely on that one person who may be on vacation. So we're looking at shared services, we're looking at sharing resources, and like Hector said, we also, prior, before we put this in place, we worked with the Department of Transportation to ensure that the connectivity from us to the campus that goes under this, you know, our connectivity between us and the campus is, is fiber optic cable sitting in the manholes. Well, so that I, connectivity was duplicated. And I think what well, that's important, we've had situations at York and a couple other places where we've had bad weather and all of a sudden, because we only have one connectivity, the whole system is down. This allows us to have multiple, multiple places, so if one goes down, we're able to yeah. rely on, on the other one. So at no given time, it's any college down. For, this, for, for the schools that haven't opted in, is there any compatibility problem, one? And two, how does it affect the shared services concept of having this, different systems at each school? So we have, we have three schools that have different non-Cisco systems, and we are working with Cisco and with the schools to figure out how I'm going to get visibility. We have a screen at, on the floor where I work where we can see every single router. And for the three schools that we can't see right now, we are going to figure out how to do that. The, the technology will not stand in the way because the, there will be an API um, as we implement this. And the designs all become relatively the same. My ability to now manage things with the shared services model is highly, highly enabled. Yes, sir. Um, there are two organizations that aren't on this list, the central office and the research foundation, are they actually on some list or? And there's one more. CUNY TV is not on this list. Well, it is on the list. It's just to be determined. But, but the yeah. central office. You, you, got it on, you, got, you have it on your foundation. list. But, so CUNY Central is basically done. We've been working I on see. CUNY Central, and CUNY Central is part of this project. Okay. CUNY TV is part of this project, and we're waiting so for some things that they're doing because they have special, yeah. Yeah, special right. needs. Okay. The Research Foundation uh, has their own IT. They have their own CIO. They are not part of this effort. They, are, they have their own. Yes. There is a set for Moso yeah. for the Research Foundation. Yeah. You know, it, it's, I was looking at this. As you know, we're, well, our charter is that we're supposed to be looking at the overall strategic plans. And I don't, I always understand that there's a reason not to do things with the Research Foundation, or not to upgrade things at the Research Foundation. And as one faculty member who does grants and projects with them, it is nutty that the Research Foundation is its own kind of arcane world and has its own Seb Formoso and has its own this, that, and the other thing. And I, I, don't, I don't get it. I mean, I, I think that, that the next time we see this plan, we should see a page on our plans for the Research Foundation because 
First of all, research is important. But second of all, we're doing an awful lot of, of employment of people and and um, uh, a lot of you know receiving funds, managing funds. You know, we ought to be on top of it. Yeah, uh, Ned. I mean, I I don't think that that is within our role, right? That 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 the the, the, the research foundation foundation is a separate five hundred one c three entity that has its own sort of bylaw structure and, and, and staff to sort of address it. That there is, there hasn't been unless there's a new mechanism. There hasn't been a mechanism that is essential okay, but as should. the over. Oh, but, but let me let me let me let me. I, I think that's that is the right legal answer. There's a separate entities, right? Uh, the point you're making is one that, in principle, is being followed. I mean, the the conversation in terms of sharing data uh, and uh, between us and um, the research foundation has increased. Uh, some systems in some recent purchases, for example, uh, have been done at the same time. They don't take advantage of the fact that, uh, I mean, I'm thinking about um, uh, the most recent one sort of being Jaeger, right, and, 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 and that work. So there's a lot more of that attempt to look at whenever the RF is looking to upgrade technology, to look at what CUNY is doing, to be able to get to that point to have the highest level of integration within uh, within systems. But so. I think I think Professor Benton, if I correct, you're talking about oversight. Is that not what you're talking about? Um, that, you, that the central officers have some oversight over the. I think that that would be true, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we're investing. We're, we're doing, if we look at what you say at the front of this, with the goals that you have, mm -hmm. I'd like you to apply those goals to the Research Foundation. And I think mm -hmm. it would be to the benefit of CUNY mm -hmm. if we did that. Yeah. And uh, it, that, that would, that's, that's really all I'm saying. And I think that the idea that at some point in the past we had them set up as a, as a separate... Um, I don't think if we were starting over, we would have all of these peripheral separate foundations and corporations and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it's not, you know, and so I, I don't really accept that as a reason to not try to do it better. With all due respect, uh, Professor Benton, it is a separate 501c3. Your recommendation... I'm sure it's been made, and, and the chair of the foundation is here with us. He's also our chancellor. They can implement their own security, but as an independent entity, which they are, and we cannot be a controlled entity, they're, they're, there's a clear conflict of interest if we were to, as an administration and as a board of trustees, try to exercise any control over their own systems, and our officers are separate officers. We are tax levied officers because, you, because it was designed that way. Well, you, I, you, I mean, that may I, be the case. I that. But I think <coughs> if you want to blow that up, uh, you risk a lot of other consequences by conflating controls between two organizations, to a state agency and a separate five hundred one c three. So it's not. It's it's certainly feasible to address the securities that you're suggesting right. internally within the the RF, and they the have the wherewithal. To do that, and certainly our chancellor can take that back to his board. And there. that's what he was saying a minute ago. Right. The, the, the spirit. There's two things. You have a philosophical yes. argument. Bracket. You have uh, technology. Can we all have as much or the same as we can? That second thing is happening de facto. Mm -hmm. Different timetables too, right? Because the RF cannot go to the state to get capital dollars to invest on. You know on some of the things, so the timing of some of the investments by, by, you might be limited in terms of the budget of the foundation, right, and that timing. But the, the, the overall second argument you're making about there should be, to the extent that we can, right, the maximum level of connectivity within systems, uh, that is occurring. There's a lot more conversation taking advantage when you hit the procurement cycles to be able to do, to have as many systems that are compatible. That's definitely happening. Okay, I'm not I'm not satisfied with the answers, but that's okay. But I accept I understand your answers. I mean, as a as a as a 
as a faculty member who gets a grant, I have to use the research foundation. And yet, I see the entity that I have to use <coughs> functioning less well compared to other parts <coughs> of the university because we, we have plans like this that address these issues for other places, but not for the research foundation. The research foundation, the research function is critical. And, and, and we need to be, um, we need to really le lean in to treating, to having it be as capable in this area as, as the rest of the university. If I can give some cold comfort with all uh, to uh, Hector Cordero Guzman, they shouldn't be retaining data, much data on their systems. Remember, the money that comes in through research is put on systems and hopefully servers that ultimately end up in the possession of the university. So they're a fiscal conduit. They, the money flows through the grant funding, the 630 some odd million dollars, whether it's municipal and federal grant funding or research funding, flows through them. But the data, the raw data that most researchers and PIs are doing sits within the university. So it should be adequately protected. And to the extent that grant money can be used for that, depending upon whether it's human research oriented, and I would presume that that's required by the NIH in some instances. You have to protect, use certain security for that. I think the ARF is probably already doing that. But we could certainly ask that well, question. Well, I think we, I mean, we have, I mean, the UFS and members of the UFS have brought to, to the attention of the Research Foundation situations where people's identities were compromised and um, and so th it's not a non-existent problem, but um, but it just anyway. I've said it. I've said it, and I'll now. Well, we should. I will I now eclipse my mouth. And the chairman of the board is heard. That's right. Yeah. So we should look into it. John, I'll just say I've spoken with Hector and members of the UFS that are on the RF board, I believe, um, and the issue is. Uh, Which Hector? Cor clarify for the record. Cordero. Before people are in CUNY. Which first. Hector? Just and, they're, and they're working on that. So I, I, I'm not trying to pile on. I, I think that there's um, good practice and effort and good faith on the RF Foundation's side to address this. <laughs> I was just, anyway. Okay. Uh, okay. Steph, are we done? One, one last chart. We talked about this earlier. The firewalls. So... Firewalls are devices, physical devices, with uh, a high level of intelligence that sit between all of our campuses and sit between our, uh, us and the internet. We have 79 firewalls that are deployed in pairs for the reason of resiliency that I mentioned earlier, so we have a spare. And the firewalls are the reason that when what happened at Baruch happened at Baruch, it did not infect anybody else. Because within minutes, we were able to shut off any traffic in and out. Incredibly important, the firewalls, right? The fire, how do the firewalls do what they do? They have to be placed correctly, and they have rules. Rules are created by humans, by technical people in the IT departments of every campus to tell the firewall how to do what it does, what to let in and what to block. We have over 200,000 rules in these firewalls. We're working. But if you said to me, what's your level of confidence that these rules are set up correctly? I don't have the eyes to visually inspect 200,000 rules. So what we're doing is, one, we are working with, again, with our best of breed partner, Palo Alto, who produces who's one of the best producers of firewalls in the country. And we're going to procure <coughs> 70 of the 79 firewalls over the next couple of years that are going to become end of life. Our friends from procurement were able to negotiate a dramatic reduction or better deal than OGS. And we leveraged that, that, that price reduction to not only get ourselves a set of firewalls that are going to be supportable over the next few years, but also a set of services we asked them, we asked Palo, because they have some technology, 
to provide us the technology to reconcile, uh, basically examine, analyze these 200,000 rules and give us the information so that we can reconcile them and make sure that they're working correctly. And two, monitor the firewall activity 24 by 7, 365. I cannot do that with people who come to work Monday to Friday, right, 8 to 5. It's, it's, it's incredibly difficult, but for a fairly good uh, service, they can do that for us. And this project is about replacing and modernizing and improving how we manage the firewalls between us and the world and between us and ourselves within CUNY so that we can better improve that. This will also be incredibly important for our ability to perform shared services. Because if I have the ability to monitor the, the, the firewall centrally, which we're setting up as a result of this project, I can therefore, you know, we, we don't need firewall expertise at every campus. By the way, an expertise that is easy, not, not easy to find and fairly expensive. So, so we're trying to reduce our, our, secu our cyber security risk, make sure that we maintain best of breed technology, and set ourselves for central management so that we do not spread ourselves too thin across the campuses. That's what this project's all about. Scott, thank you. Yeah. It seems like you managed to keep busy last year, so that's, that's encouraging. <laughs> um, anybody have any other questions for Seb while he's here? Because we're running a little long, but not too bad. Okay. With no more items on the agenda, I move to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Any, any opposition? Hearing none. There is a meeting on investment.